Well, good morning, everyone. What a delight to see you and have this wonderful honor once again to share the scriptures and share the word on Good Friday. I always look forward to this season of the year, Resurrection Sunday, of course, and the days leading up to it. We have been in a series of messages of the I Am statements of Jesus. And he said, I am many things. But the first thing we need to understand, he is just the I am in the first place. Amen. He is the I am. He is uh, what to the Jewish people uh, knew and understood the word that was given to Moses out of a burning bush when God identified himself as the I am. Jesus claims that title and he is the I am. And we've talked about several statements he made, I am something, this, that. This morning, it is no mistake, uh, Pastor Danny had uh, already chosen the text for today, that we would come to this statement. And if you have a Bible, turn with me, if you will, to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. And we're going to talk about this morning when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Now, in this passage of Scripture, this 10th chapter of John, there's actually a couple of occasions that Jesus actually makes that statement uh, back in the 11th verse. For instance, he says, I am the good shepherd. And then again, he makes that same statement in the 14th verse, I am the good shepherd. So this morning we're going to talk about Jesus' statement and what that represents and sort of unpack it a little bit of this whole statement. And, and it is a profound statement, but for time's sake and so that we can actually grasp a hold of something that's bite-sized that we can chew on, I want to narrow my thoughts down really to three statements Jesus made in association with him being the great shepherd. And so the first one is actually found in this 14th verse. He says, my, excuse me, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. And then he says, I know my sheep. And he also continues, my sheep know me. I just really want to focus on what Jesus said about himself, first of all. He said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. He knows us. He knows you. He knows me. He knows things about you that nobody else knows. He thinks things about me that we don't even know ourselves. He knows us. But the interesting thing that I want to just begin with this morning is this fact, that Jesus knows everything about everyone since long before the miracle of your birth. He has known you. He's always known you. In fact, he has known every one of us from before the beginning of time. Now, we can make that statement, but try and, as they say, wrap your head around that for a moment. He has known you, everything about you, from before time began. That's an amazing statement to think about. Why? How can that be possible? Simply because he is the ever-present, eternal I am. He is the I am before time began, and he still is. Jesus can make that statement because he's above all boundaries and all limitations of time that was, of time that is, and the time will be. And there is not a moment... There is not a place in time where he is not present. He's still present in the past. He's still present now. And he is already present in the future. He stands above and beyond the dimensions of time. Now, those statements I just made, they, you know, they sound really good. But I want you to finally understand it. So I actually brought a prop this morning. I took it out of the wall that was attached to my iPhone and to the plug at the other end. Y'all know what this is. It could be any stretch of cord. I want you to imagine this for a moment as time. This is when time began all the way down here, and this is when time will end here. That's all of time. 
Now, I want you to imagine, if you will, that you're going to have to stretch on this one even harder than trying to imagine that this is time. I want you to imagine that I'm God. <laughs> you thought I was stretching you to get you to imagine this is time. I have a perspective on this little piece of cord that no part of it has. And if this is to represent time and I represent God, try to imagine, if you can, how God is above and beyond any of the limitations of the length or any part of this. How it is that he can be here at the same time he's here. Why? Well, he's, he's God. I'm holding both ends of the time. I'm here and I'm here. And I'm present in every part of this little cord called time. And every part of the time, every tiny speck of time that any one of us might be in, he's there. And any time that's ever been, he's still there. And every time, any time that ever will be, he's already there. That's what it means to be God in the I am. He always is. And if you can think for a moment, where was Abraham? Well, maybe Abraham was here somewhere. But God says to his people, maybe that's a little further along somewhere, before Abraham was, I am. Did you get it? Did it work? A little bit? Hopefully it did. This ability... This ability of God to see everything from the beginning all the way to the end and know everything, everything that will happen before it happens, he knows it. It's not a matter of him controlling what will happen. We are still in control of our lives, but he knows what we're going to do before we've done it. It's what the theologians call foreknowledge. God has this an amazing foreknowledge to know all things. And it's out of that foreknowledge, by the way, that I understand that he predestined things. What does that mean? The Bible tells us this amazing... Well, let, let's look at it for a moment. In Ephesians chapter 1. I think we can put that on the screen too. Ephesians chapter 1. Listen to this statement that the Apostle Paul was to declare to the church he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. He's blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Oh, wonderful statement. That's true. Now look at this. The next verse says, for he chose us in him. God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world. How could he do that? Because he knew everything that was about to happen in time. And he, knowing you, knowing every decision you would make, chose and destined you and even called you to be part of his chosen, to be a part of those that he has called for himself. In love, he saw us in, before creation that we might be holy and blameless in his sight. Now continue on. In love, he predestined us. God predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with God's pleasure and his will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Since he knows every one of us who during the lifespan of our time on this earth would come to faith in him, God has already chosen us before creation that we would be called his elect. He knew us. Now listen to this. He knew us as his sheep before we knew him as our shepherd. Amen. Think on that a minute. He knew us as his sheep before we knew him as our shepherd. And he is the good shepherd. And I, uh, my t I could spend a lot of time on this. As good shepherd, that simply means he takes responsibility for every one of us. 
He takes responsibility, always has, always will. He's responsible. Just think about the 23rd Psalm, if you can remember portions of it in your mind. He has taken responsibility to lead us and to feed us. And he has taken responsibility to direct us and protect us. That's who he is. He's our God. And he says of us, he says, I am the good shepherd. And then he says, by the way, I know my sheep. I know my sheep. Aren't you glad he knows you this morning? The second statement he he makes that I just want to touch on briefly this morning is in verse 15. Uh, Just past where we were, the next verse, he says, just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He's the good shepherd who knows his sheep. That's number one. And he's the good shepherd who gives his life or lays down his life. He gives, I, says, I give my life for my sheep. Think about this for a moment. When, when, when the angel came and spoke to Joseph, and he talked to the, Joseph about Mary and her responsibility to provide a womb for the coming Christ. The angel told Joseph, it's recorded in Matthew chapter 1, you will give him the name Jesus, now listen to this, because he will save his people from their sins. What a marvelous statement. Call him Yeshua, call him Savior, call him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. Well, how is he going to do that? Well, it's, it's revealed all through scripture, but just let's remind ourselves for a moment. Think about this. For hundreds of years... For hundreds of years, the system had always been in place that it was a sacrificial offering of a chosen lamb that was to be the only offering that was accessible, or actually the proper word would be acceptable, the only acceptable offering that would provide access and favor to God was a sacrificial lamb. Jesus, we are told, was coming to save the sins, the people from their sins. So how is that supposed to happen? Do you remember when John the Baptist first introduced Jesus? He was the first one that introduced Jesus to public ministry. Before that, Jesus had been very much in the background. John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, sees him from a distance. I don't know what relationship they already have. We have no con- idea about that, make conjectures. But he looks at Jesus in a, in a, as a distant, in a distance, and, and, and he seems to be obviously very excited and proud of, of Jesus. And he says to the people around him, he says, look, the teacher has arrived. No. Look. The scholar who amazed the the, the people when he was just a boy, all of the the scribes and and the scholars in the temple. It's him. That's him. Look at him. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't call him the great rabbi. He doesn't even call him the coming king. John says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how Jesus is introduced Why? Because it's always been God's plan. It involved a sheep, a willing sacrifice. And because of Jesus' love for his sheep, he became a lamb. The shepherd becomes a lamb. Hmm. God's plan was that Jesus would provide that acceptable and only uh, required and acceptable final and full sacrifice to atone for or to pay for our sins. You read in the scriptures in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19 where the apostle Peter explains this so well. He says, God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless and spotless Lamb of God. It helps you to see the little picture here for a moment. Think about it for a moment, because all of these these sacrifice offerings have been going on for years, hundreds of years. 
And when lambs would be brought, and if you can think of a family for a moment, or, or just an individual who comes uh, before the priest, uh, and he brings his lamb, this is how uh, the, the system was set up, that he had to bring a sacrificial lamb for this man's sin, or this family's sin. And, and, and you try to imagine for a moment that the priests, they would exercise their responsibility, and they would take the lamb, and they would carefully inspect and scrutinize that lamb. Not the one who brought the lamb, but the lamb who was brought for the one, or the family, or whoever it may be, that there might be no spot, no spot, or defect, or imperfection, or blemish, because it would disqualify that lamb from being an acceptable sacrifice. Jesus is introduced as the Lamb of God. He is the one. Not only did the shepherd become a lamb, but the good shepherd became the perfect lamb. The good shepherd presented himself as the perfect lamb. And because of that, it simply means that my salvation and your salvation and my right to call myself pure and holy and righteous, my right to say I am straight to stand before God has nothing to do with anything I brought to the table. It has nothing to do with me being scrutinized or inspected. It's all about the lamb that I brought with me that says I come to God on the merits of Jesus Christ. He is the spotless lamb. It's all about him. It's not about me. The enemy who wants to keep us from coming to Christ will try and tell you it's all about you. You're not good enough. You're not righteous enough. You're not holy enough. Look him back and say, it's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. He is the spotless lamb. He is the great, great I am. Hallelujah. Jesus had no sin of his own. He died for our own, our sins, not his. He took upon himself our sin. Three statements. The first one, Jesus said, As I, I'm the great shepherd, I know my sheep. Number two, I give my life for my sheep. The third statement that Jesus makes that brought, draws my attention is the 28th verse of this same chapter. He says these words, I give them eternal life. I know them, I died for them, and I give them eternal life. Wow, it was God's love for this world where every person was destined to perish without, without hope that the gospel of John says that God so loved us. John 3, 16, the golden text of scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him shall not perish perish but have eternal life tie that together with the statement of the apostle paul in the book of romans chapter 6 verse 23 for the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through christ jesus our lord you've got wages you've got a gift wages is an earth something you earn gift is something you're given the wages of sin is death we all earned it but we have a gift it's eternal life we were to perish but now we have eternal life that's our shepherd. That's our shepherd. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus Christ on the cross not only cleansed our sin, that's a big deal, and not only he also canceled the charges against us, that's a big deal, and also he purchased eternal life. That's the biggest thing. Hallelujah. Think about it. We have eternal life. We get so tied to what we have now, which is a simple life. It's a life that's passing. It's a life where we're dealing still with sin, with an old man, an old nature that still wants to rise up within us. It's a life where we deal with sickness and pain and disease and the potential for death and knowing that we live in bodies that are weak. But I thank God he didn't die just to forgive our sins and cancel the debt against us, but he came to give us eternal life. I shall never die. Jesus said it. Jesus said, he that lives and believes in me shall never die. 
Hallelujah. That's the truth. That is the absolute truth. Let me finish with this one verse of Scripture. If you'll find it in the, in the Scriptures in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, again, just sort of capsulizes what I've been saying. The Bible says you, that's you and me, were dead because of the, your sins and because of your sinful nature that was not yet cut away. But then God, God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to his cross. Wow, what a, what a wonderful picture. I'm not only forgiven, but the charges that were put against me, he took care of those as well. The things that I may not even be aware of, the things that the enemy knows and he attacks us with sometimes and he stands with them before God and he says, look at the things this person has done. Look who he is. He's a son or he's a daughter of Adam. He is guilty. God said, no, he isn't. And there was established in a glorious moment when the eye of faith is able to look at the cross and sees a spikes going into the limbs of Jesus, but at the same time sees those spikes nailing the charges that were against us to that cross, and they will forever be there because we are set free by the blood of a perfect sacrifice, the spotless lamb, Jesus Christ. Whoa, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ah, you think I'm done preaching. Uh, but, <laughs> I hope that's for the word. Now, we're going to do something we do every year at this time, and we do it throughout the year, of course. I want us to share communion together. But today, Pastor Danny and I chatted a little bit together about what was going to happen today, and agreed it'd be a wonderful time just to extend our communion moment and to remind ourselves of what communion embraces for all of us. So you have one of these little packets. Don't open it yet. Just hang on because we're going to take a little time here. The scripture that we read so often that associates us with a clear understanding, you can read any of the Gospels, uh, except for John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke each tell the story of the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. But there's a marvelous passage of Scripture that we refer to quite often in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where the Apostle Paul talks about having received something from the Lord. Somehow the Lord had communicated with Paul what had happened in that vision or what had happened on that evening. Anybody else would have had to get the information from any of the disciples that may have been there. But the Apostle Paul gives instruction and correction to the church, to all of us. And he says that what he received, beginning verse 23, he says, I received this from the Lord. Not meant to bypass anybody else, but to give a, a sense of real clarity and authority to the word of the Lord. He said, I received this from the Lord, and, and I'm also passing it on to you. I'm passing it on to you. And then he just tells a little bit of the narrative. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Just pause for a moment. Earlier in that day, Jesus had said to his disciples, this evening is the traditional time that we have a Passover meal. And Jesus even said to his disciples, I've eagerly waited for this moment. He had so many teachings and some things to teach them. He would wash their feet. A lot would happen that evening. But the Passover meal was a specific meal. It involved a real meal that they ate. But it also involved very significant symbolic things. And the Bible tells us it was at this meal that the Lord Jesus took bread now that bread, by the way, some of it was for simple consumption as a part of the meal, but there are other parts of that bread that was on the table that had a very specific value and purpose, a reason for being there, a reminder. 
of what had happened at the very first Passover when God had delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. I'll touch that again in a minute. He broke and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do what? What I'm telling you to do. To receive it. And in the same way after supper, he took a cup, the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are declaring, you are proclaiming the Lord's death. You are proclaiming what his death accomplished until the day he comes. And then, sometimes we refer to the scriptures that follow, but just take a moment and watch with me. Therefore, this is where he brings some correction in teaching. Paul says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning. The word sin always means to fall short or miss the mark. That's what the word sin literally means. It means fall short of God's purpose or miss the mark. Whoever receives the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty of missing it, of, of falling short of what was implied or what was meant to be accomplished by the blood and the body of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment to himself. Pause there. Without recognizing, another word that's translated is the word discerning. And to discern or to recognize, now hear me very, very carefully, it means to assign a value. To discern means to look at something so you judge it. You affirm or deny what it represents, what it stands for. Can I say it simply this way? When we come and we gather like this moment at the end of this service to share communion together, we always need to recognize, to discern what we're doing what it actually represents. The first thing that he represents is the body of the Lord. In just a moment, we're going to receive this representation of his body. Why is that important? Jesus told the disciples, because it's my body which is broken for you, and Jesus even blessed it before he started. Jesus came to die, but he also came to suffer and die. The stripes, the lacerations, the tearing of his flesh was not a part of Calvary, but it was a part of the plan. Jesus was sentenced to be whipped, and he wasn't to die at that time. He was to be whipped within inches of death by professionals who knew when to quit but never quit until they had to. Profoundly, his body was ripped for us. Why? Because Jesus wanted to include something in the work he was doing. Not only would he atone for our sins, but he would provide a way that we could believe for and receive healing for our bodies. Amen. That's part of the plan. For years, I've always referred to, you can take the little cellophane part off now or the little the clear part. I've always referred to this as the, as the bread of healing. There are some, some who believe that it actually becomes Jesus' body. I'm not sure I believe that. 
But I do believe that I choose to receive it to me as his body broken for me. Why? For my healing. All of us always will find times in our lives when we need healing. It's already been provided. A little while ago, my sweetheart and I had occasion to call a very dear friend, perhaps one of the best known doctors in the U.S., known by thousands. His books have been bestsellers in the New York Times for years. Dr. Don Colbert. Jan and I have known Don and Mary for nearly 30 years. And he's been a counselor as well as a physician to us over the years from time to time. We had occasion to call Don not long ago and talk about a need within our own lives for healing. And as a doctor in the States, he can't prescribe medication. But he did offer us a prescription. Don said, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to have communion together. That's not something I didn't know, but it was wonderful to be reminded by him. The very next evening, my sweetheart and I sat together in a precious moment of talking about and receiving the bread of healing. And God answers prayer. God answers prayer. I'm not meaning to be super mystical, but I am trying to help us to do what the scripture says. Don't miss what it represents. The apostle continues and even says, there are some that have suffered sickness and some that even had died because they didn't recognize and receive this as the body of Jesus. There's a lot of people in this house, a lot of people that are watching that are suffering some sickness. Before the service, I, I, I spoke with two, po two folks, both of them dealing with significant illness, both of them cancer. We pray for one another and we believe, but I don't want to miss this opportunity. I don't want to miss this opportunity. And I don't want you to miss it neither. I'm going to ask everyone in this room, because I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God to bless this to us, to receive by faith the bread of healing today. It doesn't matter what you've been dealing with. The Holy Spirit, I believe, spoke to me, shared this with pastors as well. I, 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 think, I think right now we are just in the midst, or at least beginning of season of healing. I've heard wonderful testimonies from some of you of healing that's already happened in your homes, in our lives, in our home. We've received and continue to receive healing. Whatever you're dealing with, I want you to believe with me today that this will be a healing moment for you. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how, how, whatever diagnosis you have. Whatever the prognosis may be. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Receive it in remembrance of me. And when you do, you declare, you proclaim what I've done. So, Jesus, I thank you today that this moment is because you planned it and prepared it. This moment is because you spoke into my heart. And we agreed together. We stood together. And we prayed together. Pastor and I prayed together, believing together that this would be a special moment. So Lord Jesus, we ask your blessing upon this bread. 
And we declare today in this moment that we receive the blessings of the bread of healing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive it together. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just begin to thank him for your healing this morning? Just begin to thank him for your healing. Just take a moment and bless him that you are healed today. Declare in Jesus' name, I am healed. I am healed by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for my sin. Before it was shed for my sickness or my sin, you first allowed your blood to be spilled for my sickness and my pain. Jesus, we ask for healing for our bodies. We ask for healing for our bodies. But early this morning when I awakened, I was reminded they put a crown of thorns on your head. That was not part of the normal procedure. Somebody thought it would be a good idea to put together a crown fashioned from thorns and jam it onto the head of Jesus. Oh, that was no mistake. For there are pains that in this room there are so many suffering pains in their minds. Anxiety, depression, discouragement. I thank you, Lord Jesus, you didn't forget about what's in our heads, what's in our minds. And we proclaim healing in the name of Jesus. Healing in the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, sickness, you go. You go in Jesus' name. And then Jesus took the cup and he assigned to it a marvelous, marvelous representation. He said, this is a new covenant, a new covenant. A covenant that is established forever in my blood. What I was talking about earlier, sins forgiven, eternal life granted, charges canceled, all because of the blood. Lord Jesus, we receive this today as your blood shed for us, and we rejoice in the shepherd, the good shepherd who became the spotless lamb, giving his life and giving us eternal life all because of the blood. We bless you. We declare once again that we are children of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Shall we partake of the cup together? Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Will you stand with me? We're going to sing again that worship, wonderful song of worthy. As we sing it, would you just lift your hands and praise him? I I know we've gone a little long this morning. I thank you for your your patience and indulgence in allowing me to go a little longer than I intended. But I somehow believe that God had a plan for every word and every thought. And I, I'm believing this morning has been a change moment for you. I'm going to ask how many by faith, I want you to say this in faith, believe that the Lord has touched your body this morning. Would you lift your hand and say, I believe that in Jesus' name. I believe that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Rejoice in the Lord. Walk in your victory. Celebrate your healing. Share it with somebody and encourage them. And remember, everything and anything we have is because the Lord Jesus has accomplished it, and he is worthy. Amen.